Today's carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, was written by Charles Wesley. You might sit back and say, boy, that that name sounds familiar. Well, Charles Wesley is the other half of the Methodist Church's dynamic duo, the Wesley Brothers. If you'll remember last week, the hymn that we studied and sang, Joy to the World, was written by Charles's brother, John Wesley. And so today's hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, was written by Charles Wesley. The biblical text that's the basis for today's song is found in that great scripture passage, Luke chapter 2. And so I would encourage you to to take your Bibles today and turn with me to Luke chapter 2 as we study this uh, very familiar passage of scripture. I would venture to say that this is probably the most beloved Christmas text. Uh, I'm not sure what your family traditions are, but every Christmas morning, our family, before we open gifts, before we do anything, we gather together as a family and we read the Christmas story from Luke chapter 2. And by the way, if that's not your Christmas tradition, maybe you have Christmas traditions like Matt and you wash the dog and you change the sprinkler heads and you kick the tires, but um, I would encourage you to, uh, to make reading the Christmas story and spending a few moments as a family in worship and prayer remembering that Christmas, uh, first and foremost, is not about gifts and trees and family and even eating, even though that's so very important, but it's about Jesus Christ. Christ. And Luke chapter 2 is a tremendous passage of scripture that reminds us of that. Today we're not going to read the entire passage. We're going to focus our attention on verses 8 through 15. And so we'll put uh, the verses up on the screen if you didn't bring a Bible today. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. Luke says this, and in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that shall be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, a multitude of angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Would you pray with me one more time today? Lord, uh, thank you so much for the fact that we can meet together as, as families. Lord, so many families have come today. and Lord, as a, as a church family brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, and thank you that we can meet together and remember this all-important time. Remember our Savior's birth. The fact that God left the splendors of heaven and came to earth and took upon human flesh and lived among us, was tempted in all points, you said, just as we are, yet without sin, and then He died on the cross for us, paying the price for our sins, and three days later, gloriously rose again. Lord, today, we praise you, we honor you, we thank you for that great event, and we thank you for the significance of Christmas. Lord, I pray that you would help us today, Lord, not only to listen to these words and maybe to gain a little bit of knowledge today and learn some neat truths, but Lord, I pray that you would speak to each and every one of our hearts. Help us to realize that the reason you came to earth was for us, to have a personal relationship with each and every one of us. So Lord, I pray you'd help us to examine our hearts today to make sure that Jesus is a part of our lives. And then, as we'll see in the passage, help us to lift our voices along with the angelic choir and to worship you, realizing that you are the only one that is worthy of our praise. 
And so today we join with the angels and Lord, we sing and we praise and we worship you. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. As you well know today, angels are a hot commodity. Uh, there was a time when angels were mainly relegated to uh, Christmas cards and uh, Christmas carols, but not anymore. Angels have infiltrated the popular culture, and interest in angels is virtually soaring across the religious spectrum in North America, from mainline Christians to even those that are involved in the New Age movement. There is this renewed interest in angels and people seeking comfort from heavenly helpers. Now let me be quick to point out this morning that not everything that is said about angels is true. There's so much out there that people say about angels and just because people say it and whether you know this or not, everything on the internet is not true true. I'm not sure whether you've realized that or not. Just because it's on the internet doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. So it's important for us to be able to filter out the true facts from the untrue facts. To be able to filter out that which is biblical from that which is unbiblical. So here are a few simple facts about angels that I would like to share with you today. First of all, what are angels? We're studying Hark the Herald Angels Sing. What are angels? Well, it's important for us to realize that angels are not the spirits of deceased children. I know often people say that, and when they're grieving, they want to realize that, that you know, their child, their small child has passed away. They want to give that child some significance. And so at times we say, why, the child has passed away, and the child is an angel in heaven. There's no biblical significance for that. Now, we believe the child is in heaven, but we believe that the child has a greater position than angels, because the child is redeemed and covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. But angels are not deceased children. Angels are not the inhabitants of earth that are trying to earn their wings or earth's inhabitants who somehow earth earned their wings and later were elevated to angels. And whether you know this or not, they're not outfielders for the California angels. My sons, when they were growing up, they used to watch all these children's videos all the time, and their favorite video, or one of their favorite videos, was called Angels in the Outfield. I don't know whether you ever saw that. I've seen the video like a hundred times. And if you've watched it, I just want to clarify that the California angels are not real angels, and the ones in the, at least as far as I know, they're not, all right? Here are a couple of facts, biblical facts about angels. The first is this, angels are spirit beings. Created by God, spirit beings that do not have physical or material bodies. Now, quite frankly, the Bible doesn't tell us much about the creation of angels. It says very little about when angels were created or even how they were created. There's just a very few verses that seem to address it. Here's one, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. The apostle Paul says this, for by him... By Jesus Christ were created in heaven and on earth, or all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible or invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Most Bible scholars believe that those terms, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, are different designations of angels. And so the Apostle Paul is teaching us today that angels were created by God. Here's another fact. Angels possess great knowledge, but they're not omniscient. Angels possess superhuman power. In the Bible, we see them doing, at times, superhuman things, but they're not omnipotent, all right? They certainly do not reach the level of God. God is omniscient. He knows everything. Angels are not. God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He can do everything. Angels can not. Peter says this in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not put, pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. Here's what Peter is saying. Angels have power. They're mighty. 
but their power is limited. And their power is limited by God. Here's something that I'm sure you know, but angels, or the Bible declares that there are large numbers of angels. Uh, theologians for years have debated how many angels there are, and one of the great theological debates were how many angels could fit on the top of a pen, kind of a useless debate, but, but the Bible doesn't tell us that, but the Bible does give us some indication that there are thousands upon thousands of angels. Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 2 says ten thousands of angels. Psalm 68, 17 describes them as being thousands upon thousands thousands. In Matthew 26, 53, you'll remember Jesus said, hey, you know what? I could call 12 legions of angels. A legion was a Roman garrison of some 6,000 men. Jesus is saying, I could, I could call 12 legions of angels. I at any moment could call 72,000 angels. And they would come to my defense. They would come to my rescue. Large numbers of angels. The last thing that I want us to see though, and this is what we see in, in the hymn that we're studying today, is angels are continually praising and glorifying God. Now the name angel means messenger, and at times throughout the Bible we see angels that were sent with certain responsibilities, certain messengers to give certain instructions to different people, but the main function, hands down, of angels is that of praising and glorifying God. And almost every time we see them in Scripture, they're involved in some type, some capacity of worship. Now, as we read Luke chapter 2, and, and, and we hear, hark the herald angels sing, we, uh, we picture this massive choir of angels up in heaven singing this beautiful, melodious song. I mean, better and, uh, and more beautiful than the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, or even more beautiful than the choir that we had in front of us today, singing this beautiful song, you know, the Hallelujah Chorus or some angelic chorus. Surprisingly, though, not to contradict too much Charles Wesley today, but surprisingly, it is never mentioned one time in the Bible that the angels sing. Now, now we want to be true to Scripture. You say, Brian, do you think they do sing? I think they do. And I think at times when they're praising that is singing, but, but never in Scripture do we find them singing. Even the passage of Scripture that we're looking at today, it says that this massive choir of angels stood, and they what? And they said, they declared, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and good will towards men. They're described as praising. They're described as worshiping. But they're not described as singing. And notice once again the passage that we're looking at this morning. Verse 13, I mentioned it says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying. Now whether the angels sang, whether the angels cried out, whether the angels spoke with a special angelic language, we're not sure. But we do know that they were passionately, they were reverently worshiping God. And so today I kind of want to draw out two truths from Luke chapter 2 that are seen not only in this biblical passage, but two truths that are also seen in the song that we're highlighting today, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And I want to look at two words. The first is the very first word of that hymn, it's the word hark. And we want to see what that means, and you'll see it in Luke chapter 2. And then the second word that I want to see is the first word of the third verse that says, Hail. So today we're looking simply at, Hark, God desires for all men to hear. And hail, God desires for all men to hear to worship. We see that clearly in the passage of scripture that we're looking at today. So if you have your outlines in front of you and you want to follow along, the first thing we're looking at this is this, heart, God desires for all men to hear. And let me pause for a second. You know the story, but let me remind you of that which is taking place in Luke chapter 2, because we kind of leapfrogged over the first seven verses of this chapter, and we arrived at verse 8. But let me remind you what takes place. Let me fill in the gaps from verse 1 to verse 7, or, or verse 8. 
because of a national census that was taking place throughout the Roman Empire, Mary and Joseph were forced to return to Joseph's hometown of Bethlehem. A trip of some 80 miles. Now, for you and me, we'd sit back and say 80 miles, no big deal. That's kind of a, an afternoon jaunt for us. Kind of an easy, lazy trip. By our standards, it would be a piece of cake. But it was a harrowing trip for a pregnant woman during New Testament times. I'd remind you that there were no planes, trains, and automobiles then. All right, Mary and Joseph either traveled on foot or Mary traveled on the back of a donkey. Either way, it would have been a harrowing, a very difficult 80-mile trip for Joseph and Mary. Because of the many travelers that were coming into the town of Bethlehem and that were traveling all over Judea, as they arrived in the city or the town of Bethlehem, there was no place for Joseph and Mary to stay. We can only imagine the relief, the relief that Joseph felt when he found an innkeeper who graciously said, I have no rooms in my inn, but if you want to, why you can spend the night, you can spend a few days out in the stable with the animals. It certainly wasn't Bethlehem Memorial Hospital, but it had a roof over it. And it allowed them just a little bit of escape from the elements. And there on that day, in the midst of dirt, flies, hay, and animal excrement, God incarnate entered into the world. In that moment, an animal trough became the holy of holies. The place where the presence of God dwelt. How would heaven respond to the human birth of the eternal Son? Our text says that a heavenly choir of angels was immediately dispatched to the area. Their unannounced concert wasn't given, you know, there in the Bethlehem Center for Performing Arts. They didn't declare their praises in front of the leading officials of the city of Bethlehem or the leading officials of Judea and Israel. No, the angels appeared to a lowly group of shepherds on a Judean hillside. Listen, that that is so very significant, and I know we all know the story so much that it's easy for us to bounce through and bounce over the simple truths that are found in the story of Christmas. But the angels appeared to shepherds on the hillside. You sit back and you say, okay, Brian, what? Okay, I'm not catching it. What does that mean? How does that apply to us today? Here's what I want you to catch. The message of Jesus is available to anyone. I want you to catch that today. It's available to anyone. And we see that by the simple fact that Jesus appeared, or excuse me, the angel appeared, first of all, to shepherds. Now, today you and I have this romanticized view of what shepherds were and maybe even even what shepherds are. We view them with fondness. We view them with affection. Part of that is because Jesus took upon himself the role of the shepherd and Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And so we look upon shepherds with fondness and affection. But that was not the case during New Testament times. You see, the people of Bethlehem, the people of Judea, did not look on the shepherds with fondness nor with affection. Several facts about shepherds during this time. The first is this. The shepherds were considered the social outcasts of the community. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? They were on the lowest end of the socioeconomic ladder. They were uneducated. They were unskilled. And they certainly were not respected. You say, Brian, how low were they? They were pretty low. Shepherds were lumped in with tax collectors, prostitutes, and dung sweepers. That's what shepherds were. And it's amazing that that's who the angel appeared to. The shepherds were considered social outcasts. 
But the shepherds also were considered spiritually unclean. You see, shepherds were around animals all the time. And when you're around hundreds of animals, every now and then an animal dies. And it's the responsibility of the shepherd to take care of the carcass, to take care of the body. Something which what? Something which made them unclean according to Old Testament law. On top of that, they profaned the Sabbath by working on the Sabbath day, by watching sheep on Israel's holy day. As a result, religiously, they were viewed as not worthy. They were outcasts, not worthy to participate in temple worship. Thirdly, the shepherds were considered untrustworthy. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? You wouldn't want to share a secret with a shepherd. They were known for not telling the truth, not keeping the truth. You wouldn't share a secret, much less an important announcement with them. Yet miraculously, that is precisely to whom the angels were sent. Wrap your arms or your mind around that for a second. Why would God not have sent the angels to the high priest? Why would God have not sent the angels to the Levites, to the religious leaders? Why would God send the angels to give the greatest announcement in the history of the world to a group of men who were socially outcast, spiritually unclean, and untrustworthy? Why would the angel come to them? I believe there's such an important message there. The message very simply is this, that the message of Jesus is for everyone. It doesn't matter this morning who you are or what you are experiencing. It doesn't matter today whether you're wealthy, poor, or really poor. It doesn't matter if you have a college education or you have no education whatsoever. It doesn't matter if your spouse has left you, your family has rejected you, or whether you feel completely alone. The message of Jesus is for you. The message of Jesus is for anyone. If it was for the shepherds, it's for me, and it's for you as well. But, but we see another truth that's, that's very similar. You're going to think that I'm being repetitive, but I'm not. Because the message of Jesus is not only for every, a, a, anyone, but the message of Jesus is also available to everyone. Uh, we see that. If you'll notice in verse 10 in the passage, notice what the angel said. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for, what does he say? All the people, all right? I, I give you these difficult quizzes all the time, but somebody tell me, what does the word all mean? All. It, mean, it means everybody, todos, everybody's included, everyone. The message comes to the shepherds and says, hey, you know what, I'm telling you first, but I want you to know that the message I'm telling you is not just for the shepherds union, all right? It's not just for guys who take care of sheep. It's not just for the lowest of the low. It's not just for the down and outers. Why, the message that I'm giving you is for everyone. It is for all the people, which the angel says. If you go later in the chapter, to chapter 2 and verse 32, when it describes this, it says, talking about Jesus coming, he says, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of to your people Israel. In those two phrases, everybody is included. And so the angel says that the message of the gospel is what? It is all inclusive. It's not just for a limited group. It is for everyone. A couple of simple applications that I drew from it. Let me mention them to you. The first is this. The gospel is not monocultural. The gospel isn't given just to one culture, all right? The gospel is for every culture. 
Man, and, 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 and we need to realize this. I'm as patriotic as anybody, but the gospel is not an American invention. We have to be really careful that we do not Americanize the gospel. The gospel is not about the United States of America. The gospel is about Jesus Christ. And Jesus didn't come just to redeem and save our nation. He came to redeem and save our enemies as well. And the angel says that the gospel is for everyone. Jesus was born for every race. Jesus was born for every nation. Jesus was born for every people. And by the way, every church, our church, should reflect that. Because the Bible says in Revelation, one day when we get to heaven, there's going to be people from every nation, from every tribe, from every tongue, from every people group. We're all going to be together. Why? Because Jesus died. Jesus came for every single one of us. The gospel is not monocultural. The second thing I said is this, the gospel is not monogenerational. It's not just for the older generation. Nor is it just for the younger generation. Jesus loves and reaches out to every generation. And the third is this, I hope I don't shock anybody, I'm sure you know that at our, this at our church, but the gospel is not monodenominational. It's not just given to one denomination. No one denomination has dibs on the gospel. The gospel is not just a Baptist belief, a Catholic catechism, a Lutheran lesson, or a Presbyterian principle. Didn't you like the way I threw all those out? Huh? All right. It's not any of those things. The truth is that Jesus came to earth for everyone. Peter says it this way in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slow this slowness, but is patient toward you not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Here's what, here's what our hymn says. Hark. The word hark means to listen. It means to pay attention. That's basically what the angels are saying. Listen. Pay attention. The message of Jesus is for you. Let me pause for a second. And I ask you a simple, personal question. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? You might sit back and say, I'm an American, Brian. Of course I do. I didn't ask you what your nationality was. You might sit back and say, I'm a Baptist, Brian. Of course I do. Or I'm a Catholic. Of course I do. The gospel has nothing to do with, to a certain degree, with denominations. Even though I hope those denominations are preaching the gospel, it's not one thing. It's about you and a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We see on a regular basis that the term religion is used very infrequently in the Bible, very infrequently. As a matter of fact, I've counted five times that the word religion is used in the New Testament. Three out of the five times is used negatively and not positively. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? God does not want us to be religious. He wants us to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, a relationship with Jesus Christ is going to drive me towards spirituality. But when I get to heaven, he's not going to say, okay, Brian, hand it over. Hand me your denominational card. What is it? Who are you? All right. He's not going to say that. The question is going to be this. What have I done with Jesus Christ? Have I received him? Have I accepted him? Have I put my faith and trust in him alone? You see, the angels came and they said, Hark, everybody listen. God desires for everyone to hear. And let me pause for a second and say, that's why we're so highly involved in missions around the world. I mean, I've used this quote before. John Piper says, missions exist because worship doesn't. And the simple fact that God wants people all around the world to know him and worship him behooves us, it drives us to be involved in missions, whether it's in Haiti or whether it's in um, Burkina Faso, wherever it is. By the way, I spoke with Mike Rittering this week in Burkina Faso. The, uh, the women's center that we are totally supporting is up and running. And God is using it in a great way. And so we rejoice in that. Hark, 
God desires for all men to hear. There's a second point in your notes, and it's found in the song as well. It's the word hail. God desires for all men to worship. Verse 3 of Hark the Herald Angels Sing says, Hail the heaven-born Prince of, of Peace. You might sit back and say, Brian, what does hail mean? Well, let me just clarify. It's not the word hell with a southern accent, all right? That's not, it's not saying hail, you know, you know, with a southern accent. That's not what it is. It's a completely different word. The word hail means to acclaim. Uh, it means to approve enthusiastically. It means to worship. That truth is seen in Luke chapter 2, the verses that we read just a few moments ago, verses 13 and 14. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Would you walk with me? I want to walk through that phrase and I want to dissect that phrase. That's a very well-known phrase, but I want us to understand what that phrase means. First of all, the word glory. The angels declared glory. The word glory comes from the Greek word doxa, which means to seem or to give a correct estimate. Often at times churches will sing the doxology, which is a praise song that is basically saying we are telling God exactly who you are. You are who you seem. You are who you claim to be. It is a word that has come to mean honor or renown, worship, glory to God. By the way, I know there's a lot of people named glory, but there's only one person that is really worthy of that name, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to God, he says, in the highest. A lot of uh, discrepancy as to what that phrase means, but, but most believe that it means that Jesus is not only worthy of glory here on earth, but he is also just as worthy of honor, glory, and praise in the highest heavens. Glory to God, not only here, but in the highest heavens. May Jesus be glorified. Peace. In goodwill, the word peace comes from the Greek word irene. It means wholeness, health, well-being. It's the Greek equivalent of the word of the Hebrew word shalom. Now notice, here's where it gets a little tricky and here's where we mess up the interpretation just a little bit because the phrase says, glory to God in the highest, peace. And then that phrase on earth and depending upon your translation, goodwill towards men or on whom God is pleased. We'll talk about what that means in just a few moments. Let me give you three thoughts, three applications to that, and we'll be done today. The first thought, as we look at that phrase, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill uh, uh, with whom God is pleased. Three thoughts. The first is this, whether in heaven or in earth or on earth, Jesus is worthy of praise. Think with me today. Before Jesus came to earth, he was the eternal son. He said in Revelation chapter 1, I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I am the first and the last. Jesus didn't begin to exist in Bethlehem. Jesus existed before he came to Bethlehem. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see, in all eternity past, Jesus was the eternal Son that inhabited and received the praises of heaven. After his birth, his sinless life, his sacrificial death, and his glorious resurrection, Jesus continues to be equally worthy of praise. So here's the challenge for us today. Not only today, but during this Christmas season and actually every day of our lives. The challenge for us is to join with the angelic chorus and cry out glory to God in the highest. Holy Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. 
whether in heaven or in earth, Jesus is worthy of praise and honor and glory. Now, now, now the question is this. The question is not, is he being praised in heaven? Because he is. There are seraphim that are around the throne of God that are continually crying out, holy, holy, holy. He is being praised in heaven at this precise moment. But the question is this. Is he being praised in your life? Is he being worshipped in your life? Is he being honored in your life? Because Jesus is worthy of praise, not only in heaven, but Jesus is worthy of praise here. And Jesus is worthy of praise here. Are you giving to Jesus the praise that he so rightly deserves? We saw last week that we were recognized, or we were created to recognize his glory. We were created to give him praise. I know in just a few moments, we're going to go eat somewhere. You might go home and eat. You might go to a restaurant and eat. We're going to probably go eat. If you're like us, we're going to eat at some point in uh, the very near future. not going to tell you where we're going to eat unless you want to buy our meal. If you want to buy our meal, we'll tell you where we're going to eat. But all right. But, but, but listen, simple analogy. A human, a, a, a person that does not praise God is like a restaurant that serves no food. Think about that for a second. Uh, kind of pointless. Great big sign out front, restaurant. All right, we're starving. Let's go in. You sit down and get a table. Somebody comes up, they welcome you, and you sit there by yourself. Nobody comes to serve you. After about 15 or 20 minutes, you kind of raise your hand. You're trying to get somebody's attention. Listen, listen, can you come over? We're, we're hungry. Can you give us a menu? Oh, I'm sorry, we don't, we don't serve food here. I know, but you have a restaurant. Yeah, 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 I know we have a restaurant on the sign. We call ourselves a restaurant, but, but we really don't serve any food here. Enjoy your time with us. How long are you going to stay there? And you're going to bolt out that door as fast as you possibly can. Why? A restaurant that does not serve food doesn't fulfill its purpose. A restaurant exists. Why? So that we can eat there. That's why a restaurant exists. Listen, you were created to worship God. You were not created to make money. You were not created to be a success. You were not created to procreate and have a family. You were not created to enjoy all the good things of life. God allows us in His grace to partake in all of those things. But I was created and you were created to worship Him. And He alone is worthy of our worship. Let me challenge you this Christmas season, fulfill your purpose. Do what you have been created to do. Worship God. We were created to worship. Here's the second point. Giving God glory is the prerequisite of peace. Giving God glory is the prerequisite of peace. Notice what it says in the passage. Glory to God in the highest. And then on earth, peace and goodwill among those whom please God. For generations, centuries, man has been looking for long-lasting, unbreakable, consistent peace. Yet to know avail. Wars persist. Marriages break up. Families are splintered and friendships are broken. As much as we strive for, as much as we long for peace, peace is difficult, difficult to grab a hold of. It's like a greased pig. You just can't grab it. We need to realize that before peace comes, God must be honored and glorified. Many cry out today, God, give us peace, and then we'll glorify you. And they fail to realize that they've got it backwards. God says, glorify me, and then I'll give you peace. You want peace in your home? Glorify God. You want peace in your relationships? Glorify God. 
You want peace at work? Glorify God. Put God and God alone in the place that He alone deserves. You see, giving God the glory is the prerequisite for peace. Jesus said it this way in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Don't let your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Believe in me. Honor me. Glorify me. And I will give you peace. Man, I know this is, this is a stressful time of year. Anybody feel stressed out yet? All right, um, I, I guarantee you there's more of us that feel stressed out than that. We're just, we're just not. This is a stressful time of year. It's not. We've got to get shopping done. The traffic is horrendous, absolutely horrendous. It's so amazing that the time of year that we say peace on earth and goodwill towards men is the less peaceful time of year in many lives and many families. The reason is that is we have a tendency to invert everything. And we make it about us. And we don't make it about glorifying God. Man, I, I'm not saying don't have a tree. I'm not saying don't give gifts. I'm not saying don't eat till your heart's desire. I'm saying do all of that. I'm going to do all of that this Christmas, all right? You might not recognize me next Sunday when I walk in, all right? <laughs> all right? But, but peace comes when we give God the glory that he deserves. One, one last truth and we're done. God's gift of peace is only offered to those who please Him. The last phrase is polemic. The last phrase of this declaration is debated. As a matter of fact, you have a translation that might say something completely different. As a matter of fact, the new King James says, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. The NIV says, goodwill to those in whom his favor rests. The Holman says, to whom or to people he favors. And the ESV that we're reading from today says, among those whom he is pleased. Pervading thought is this. During Christmas time, God wants to give everybody peace. That's his desire. At Christmas time, he just wants everybody to peace out. And he wants to give you peace. That's not what this passage of Scripture is saying. As a matter of fact, if you look at other words of Jesus, Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. Now, now I'm not going to get into what that means today. But, but here's what Jesus is saying in the passage. Jesus is saying that God's gift of peace is only offered to those who please him. We declare that in Christmas cards, holiday sentiments, and even in ceasefire agreements that God wants to give peace to everyone. But as I mentioned, that's not what this verse is saying. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. So you might sit back and say, okay, Brian, I get it. Tell me how I can please God. Tell me, what do I have to do to please God? Right here's the kicker. You can't do anything to please God. There, there, is, there is nothing that you and I can do to please God. It is impossible for us to please God on our own. Here's what I mean. You can never be good enough. You can never be religious enough. You can never attend church enough. You can never walk enough old ladies across the street. You can never deliver enough cookies to disabled and older people. You can never say enough kind words. There is nothing, there is never enough that you and I can do so that God looks down from heaven and says, boy, look at that Brian. Man, does he please me. You see, Isaiah says this, that all of our good works... The very best things that we do in God's eyes are just like filthy, dirty rags. You might sit back and say, well, man, is that unfair? 
What are you talking about? The only way that we can, uh, that God gives us peace is if we please Him. And you're telling me, Brian, we can't please Him. That's right. That's exactly what I'm telling you today. Romans says this, there's none righteous, no, not one. What's the answer? The answer today, catch this. Here's the message today. The answer is Jesus. It is only through Jesus that you can please God. It is only through Jesus that I can please God. You see, Jesus is the way, he's the door, he's the sacrificial lamb, he is your substitute, and he wants to be your savior. And the only way that we can ever please God is when we realize that we can't please God, and we repent of our sins, we cry out to God, and we say, God, I'm a sinner, God, even the very best that I do cannot please you. God, today I confess that and I, by faith, receive what Jesus Christ did on the cross for me. And today he takes my sin and I claim the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which is offered through me to me through the death of Jesus Christ. And by faith, I'd receive that which I could never, ever, ever earn. That's why the angel says, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, plea, or, or, and on earth, goodwill to them whom, with whom God is pleased. You say, Brian, how is God pleased with me? The only way that God is pleased with you is if your sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's not a weird, grotesque thing that I'm talking about. I'm talking about an act of faith where I realize what Jesus did for me, and by faith I ask Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sins, to come into my heart, and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness, and for my sins to be covered by His blood. And at that moment, according to Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, I'm justified, I'm declared righteous in the sight of God, just as if I have never, ever sinned. And at that moment, I have peace with God. And I'm offered the peace of God. Here's, here's what the angel says. Hark, God wants everyone to hear. Hail, God wants everyone to worship. And worshiping doesn't mean that I come to church the Sunday before Christmas. I'm thrilled all of you are here. But worship means that I recognize who he is today and tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and January 1st and July 1st. I realize who Jesus is. And I realize that without him, I am nothing. Now that's a reason to praise, is it not? Because he makes me what I could never, ever be. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory, honor, and praise be to the newborn king. Is he your king? Is he your savior? Can you praise him today?